32 gigabytes or 48 gigabytes of DDR5 memory? That's the question a lot of people will have on their minds when building a new system these days, which will be used for gaming. Are modern games now taking advantage of higher RAM capacities, and will it allow the player to experience a boost in performance? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey what is going on guys, Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today we'll be going over a bunch of data to see if modern games are now taking advantage of higher memory capacities. This is something I've been wanting to test for a while now since most system builders today are more than likely going to be opting for DDR5. Now with DDR5 being the go-to, I decided to just benchmark two capacities. 32 gigabytes and 48 gigabytes, and I will explain my reasoning behind this. You see, while you can find 2x8 16 gigabyte kits of DDR5 memory for like 60 bucks, I think most system builders will be paying the extra $30 or so and getting a 2x16 32 gigabyte kit clocked at like 6,000 mega transfers CL30, if not higher, especially if you're on an Intel platform. The other thing is that most of the 16 gigabyte kits being sold offer slow speeds around 5,200 and 5,600 mega transfers with most topping out at around 6,000 mega transfers, which if you're on a really strict budget, then it'll get you by, but I would definitely recommend stretching that budget just a bit and you'll end up with a faster kit and double the memory capacity. The reason why I also didn't test 64 gigabytes is because for a similar and an opposite reason. For gaming, you just straight up don't need that much RAM unless your machine is primarily going to be used for production and then gaming is done on the side. The other thing is that 2x32 64 gigabyte kits are dual rank sticks and then you bring in another variable into the testing which is dual rank versus single rank and what we're more focused on is just capacity. Also with dual rank kits you can't clock them as high as single rank kits. In these tests we're going to be using two different single rank kits 2x16 and 2x24 which I've overclocked to 7600 mega transfers. Maybe in a future video I might test single rank versus dual rank if there's enough demand for it. But since most people are moving towards DD DDR5, I wanted to know if 32 gigabyte single rank kits are the sweet spot or if you should pay the extra 50 or 60 dollars and buy a 2x24 48 gigabyte kit where you still get high frequency and I find it to be a nice middle ground if you're also going to be delving into some production work. For my personal system, I'm using a 2x24 48 gigabyte kit running at 8000 mega transfers and it's been absolutely fabulous. It fulfills all my gaming and content creation needs just fine. Something else I wanted to point out and and it's another major reason why I was prompted on making this video is that when I was looking up this comparison for myself, I just couldn't really find a video or review of some sort benchmarking a larger volume of recent modern games at three different resolutions with ray tracing involved. Most of the content I've seen involves a few select games at one resolution and many of them are still using older games from like six years ago, despite some of those videos being released this year. Don't get me wrong, I'm still using a game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider every once in a while in some of my benchmark suites as it's shown to scale fairly well with hardware. However, it's the latest games which garnered the attention of gamers utilizing newer technology and so I wanted to see if new stuff will take advantage of more RAM if it's available. So for my video, I've benchmarked modern games released from the last few years. The most oldest title in my list is from 2020, and that's because it's gotten a lot of updates and is still quite popular. There are 23 games that I've tested, with most of them released in 2024 or 2023. With that out of the way, let's go over the test specifications, and then we'll jump into the benchmarks. So for my CPU, we've got an Intel Core i9-14900K, which has its P cores running at 5.7 GHz, E cores are overclocked to 4.6 gigahertz and the ring is running at 5 gigahertz. The motherboard is an MSI Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2. For our memory kits, the 32 gigabyte kit is from Team Group. This is part of their T-Create series and I really like this kit for its low profile heat sinks which still do a really good job. This kit has an XMP profile rated at 7200 CL34 but I've got it overclocked to 7600 CL36. The other kit is from Patriot which is part of their Extreme 5 lineup. It has an XMP profile rated to run at 8200 CL 38 but obviously you can't run that on a 4 dim board and like I said the objective of this video is to compare capacities so I'm 
I'm also running this kit at 7600CL36. The graphics card we're using is an MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio, which has a plus 200 offset to the core and plus 1500 offset to the memory. Our games are stored on a Corsair MP600 Pro LPX4 terabyte, and powering all of these components is an EVGA 1000G3. So starting us off first, we have God of War Ragnarok at 1080p. The results between 48GB and 32GB are neck and neck, averaging 225fps and 223fps respectively. Even at 1440p, both setups deliver an identical 226fps, showing that the game is still heavily CPU bound. At 4K, the GPU finally takes over, but the difference remains insignificant. With 200fps for 48GB and 201fps for 32GB, the extra RAM doesn't matter here. You're bottlenecked elsewhere. Next, we have the hottest shooter on the block, Call of Duty Black Ops 6. And I gotta say, I've been having a lot of fun with this Call of Duty. I haven't had this much fun since Modern Warfare 2019. And the performance has been great. This fast-paced shooter shows minimal differences across RAM capacities, with 48GB slightly ahead at 368fps versus 366fps at 1080p. At 1440p and 4K, the numbers remain close, with both setups pushing well over 300fps and 200fps respectively. Honestly, I at these frame rates, you're going to be too busy fragging enemies to notice any real difference. Moving on, and we have another popular shooter at 1080p, Counter Strike 2 is pure overkill, with both setups delivering absurdly high frame rates 824 FPS for 48 gigabytes and 830 FPS for 32 gigabytes. Even at 1440p, the averages stay sky high at 673 FPS for 48 gigabytes and 678 FPS for 32 gigabytes. At 4K, performance remains stellar with both setups pushing over 380 FPS. Whichever configuration you choose, it's clear the game won't break your sweat. I just recently finally beat Black Myth Wukong, and man, this game was quite the adventure. It has beautiful environments, and the combat was just super thrilling. I highly recommend checking it out if you like single-player action-adventure games that are challenging. In our testing, we're running at 67% DLSS quality, with ray tracing on medium, and this demanding title shows no major differences in performance with both setups averaging a of 140 fps at 1080p at 1440p the results are still comparable hovering around 111 fps for 48 gigabytes and 112 fps for 32 gigabytes by 4k the gap is still close but it's clear the gpu limitations rather than ram capacity are the primary factor here Bethesda Starfield is next, and here the story is much the same, both setups averaging above 140 FPS at 1080p. At 1440p, it dips slightly, but the numbers are again within margin of error. At 4K, performance levels out at just over 100 FPS, proving that Starfield's performance isn't impacted at all going beyond 32GB. Senua's Hellblade 2 is another game which follows the same trend. This visually stunning game highlights how even the most taxing titles don't often need extra RAM. At 1080p, both setups average near identical performance with 120 FPS on 48 gigabytes and 120 FPS on 32 gigabytes. By 1440p and 4K, the differences remain imperceptible with averages in the high 80s and mid 40s respectively. Warhammer Space Marine 2 is an absolute joy to play, taking us back to the good old days of no fluff, just straight up chaotic action. This game doesn't seem to benefit at all from the extra RAM capacity, as both configurations are neck and neck. Along with that, you can tell there's a heavy CPU bottleneck in place, as the performance going from 1080p to 1440p barely changes. At 4K, both configurations are still neck and neck here. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is a game that's really well optimized, and this gives us the headroom to utilize ray tracing on high settings without needing to use upscaling or frame generation, so we're playing at native resolution. I thought with ray tracing involved, we might see some more interesting results, but as you guys can see across all three resolutions, there is no advantage of going with 48 gigabytes in this title. Just like with Ratchet & Clank Return Returnal is another game that runs really well, and we're able to use ray tracing at native quality settings. However, just like the previous titles, performance across all three resolutions is the same for 32GB versus 48GB. So let's move on. When it comes to Horizon Forbidden West, performance is steady and comparable across resolutions, with 32GB leading slightly at 173fps versus 169fps at 1080p. At 1440p, averages dip to around 145fps with no practical difference between the two setups. At 4K, both configurations hover just below 100 FPS, proving that this title benefits more from GPU optimization rather than additional RAM. Up next, we have Ghost of Tsushima. Whether you go with 48GB or 32GB, the Samurai Action Adventure runs beautifully with either setup, with 48GB averaging 184FPS compared to 185FPS 
at 1080p. By 1440p and 4K, performance stays steady with differences well within margin of error. This one's all about the visuals and story, not RAM size. In Alan Wake 2, even with path tracing, the strain on RAM doesn't become an issue. 32GB is ample, as evident by the results here, which show little to no performance differences against the 48GB kit. So far, it's looking like for gaming, going beyond 32GB seems pointless. But let's keep going and we might see some interesting results. The Last of Us Part 1 is a game that already ran really well with 32GB of memory, and we can see that with our result. Adding another 16 gigabytes of memory doesn't do anything for performance, and I would say that's a good thing, as then you, that means you get to save money. Whether that's 1080p, 1440p, or 4K, performance is all the same. At 1080p, Remnant 2 sees 48GB averaging 178fps, with 32GB close behind at 177fps. The gap is minimal, and both setups perform admirably. At 1440p, both configurations level out at around 165fps, showing that the game is leaning more towards the CPU even at this higher resolution. At last, at 4K, both systems average just under 100 FPS, which is still very playable. In short, RAM size won't matter here unless you're juggling heavy multitasking in the background. In Marvel Spider-Man Remastered, with ray tracing, I wasn't really expecting much to change, and that was the right mindset. Across all three resolutions, performance doesn't change, and in fact you'll notice that even at 4K, performance doesn't drop as much, suggesting we are actually bottlenecked by our CPU here. Alright, so I won't bore you guys, so we're going to be cycling through these quickly. In Total War Warhammer 3, using the Mirrors of Madness benchmark, which puts in a ton of units on screen, there was no change between the two configurations, regardless of resolution. The same behavior can also be seen from Forza Horizon 5, the performance is virtually identical between the two RAM configurations. A Plague Tale Requiem is next, and again, nothing really changes, going from 32GB and 48GB is not advantageous for the gamer. Baldur's Gate 3 is a game which relies heavily on CPU performance, and it really shows here. Going to 48GB really didn't do anything at all, it's all margin of error stuff. Hogwarts Legacy with ray tracing, it's the same story, no changes here, which is interesting because the RAM allocation with this game can be pretty high. Cyberpunk 2077 using ray tracing with ultra settings is the same thing. 32GB offers the same performance as 48GB. Then we have the same scenario with Resident Evil 4 with ray tracing, and then finally we have Lies of P, which is an awesome Souls-like, but it also doesn't show us any advantages from having more RAM beyond 32GB. But it doesn't even matter anyways as the performance seen in these last couple of titles was stellar to begin with. So finally we have our 23 game average, and to nobody's surprise, both configurations offer the exact same performance. I already knew that for the most part, we wouldn't see any major differences, but this is also why I was mainly focusing on newer games, thinking that perhaps maybe one or two newer games might show us some interesting results. But there's your answer, if you're upgrading or building a new system that uses DDR5 and you're primarily going to be gaming with it, then just stick with 32GB of RAM as it's ample, and then you can save that extra 50 or $60, give or take, use that towards something else like better storage or more storage, more cooling towards the game or just pocket the difference. And when I ran my poll on my community page, it looks like a lot of you guys are already aware about this. 32 gigabytes of RAM capacity was the most popular result. Well, that's going to be wrapping it up for this one. Hope you guys at least learned something and we'll touch base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.